I actually tried to call Trish a couple times this week to tutor her. Did you just breathe in the phone or did you get a hold of her? Why was 2000 widely considered to be one of the best years in WWE history from a creative standpoint without their biggest star in Stone Cold Steve Austin? Well, the short answer is they had a deep roster full of very entertaining talent and there was a lot of great storytelling long term, mind you, that was being used around this time. Kind of unfamiliar territory in the last couple of years of the Attitude Era. But the WWF is going through a bit of a maturation process at this point. And I don't mean maturation as in more mature sleazy things. In fact, quite the opposite. Things are beginning to be toned down there a little bit. Emphasis on a bit. And you'll see it in this week's classic review of SummerSlam 2000 from August 27th at the Raleigh Entertainment and Sports Center in Raleigh, North Carolina. The show was nominated by the Badarse Mofo, Daniel Cook, the lad Robert Hunter, Jared Sedwick, and Sam Adelaide over at patreon.com slash wrestling with regret. The opening hype package is an operatic experimental film produced by David Sahadi, directed by Freddie Fellini, and it's called Crimes of Passion. A lot of opera, crazy spinning ghosts they would later repurpose for Christian's entrance video the next year, Freddie Blassie, a dude pumping iron, there's some lady watching TV with her dog. Wait, why is the guy holding the TV now? My head hurts. 570,000 pay-per-view buys for this one, a bit less than the previous year, but more than the year after. 18,128 folks packed the Entertainment and Sports Center. Jim Ross and Jerry Jerry Lawler on commentary. And your opening contest sees the right to censor. That's Stephen Richards, Bull Buchanan, and The Good Father, huh? Taking on Rikishi and Too Cool. Yes, Stephen Richards has run a bit of a recruiting campaign over the last several weeks. He brought in Bull Buchanan, who last we saw in programming was the assistant or the friend of the big boss man. Buchanan recently beat The Godfather in a match on Raw to get rid of the hose, and so he was rechristened that week as The Good Father. There's a big save the Hose campaign featuring a young Victoria before she became a crazy lesbian character on air. These two are outside picketing during the shows in the crowd before the show with the audience and everything. So the whole right to censor thing and Stephen Richards culture war against all things that he considers to be immoral and tasteless. It's basically WWE's response to the Parents Television Council who's been breathing down the Federation's neck for months and months over their more risque content and trying to start these uh, boy boycott campaigns and trying to write to these advertisers telling them to pull their ads from WWF programming and to an extent it was working and the WWF listened. This was the beginning of a time where they're starting to get away from some of that sleazier element of the Attitude Era. Val Venus is not a porn star anymore. The Godfather is here, you can see, no longer a pimp. DX, or what's left of them at this point, isn't as crude as they once were. There's a lot of things you're seeing here taking place where there's a lot of the same spirit and vigor and attitude, so to speak, of the WWF that you're accustomed to. But in terms of some of the minor details as to what they are showing, what they aren't showing, what they're saying and not saying, it's becoming more apparent here that there is a bit of a change coming on. Before he's interrupted, Stephen gets on the microphone and saying he's disappointed that folks in the Bible Belt here don't support them. Out come Too Cool and Rikishi with the hose. Scotty and Grandmaster with the advantage early on. On the outside, the good father's pie face is the lady. RTC working over Sex A, Steven getting some of his first official entering action in months here. Sex A with a superplex, he loses his dreads in the process. Hot tag to Rikishi, the crowd goes nuts. Each member of Right to Censor is squashed in the corner. Scotty setting up the worm, but he walks into a Steven kick, the pin and the win. I'm gonna give it one and a half stars out of five. There wasn't really much to this match. It was so short, and that's kind of a recurring theme for a lot of the matches on this night. Kind of blink and you miss it action. Still told a pretty good story, and the crowd was definitely alive for it, even though the bad guys won this one. And by the way, get used to hearing that siren a lot, because you will hear it a whole lot in the rest of the year 2000, early 2001. But yeah, the crowd was definitely vocal for it, and it definitely got them woken up for this show. We get a recap of what happened earlier in the night on Heat. You see the coach asking Kurt Angle what the deal was, then kissing Stephanie the previous SmackDown, but Kurt walks away. Later in the show, Stephanie McMahon Helmsley arrives, not sure why not with her husband. And then the episode ends with Kurt going into Stephanie's locker room. Ooh, scandal. Then they show the replay of the end of the previous SmackDown when Kurt did kiss Stephanie McMahon. Then we go to Michael Cole backstage with Shane McMahon, the hardcore champion. More on that in a minute. Shane says he supports every decision 
Stephanie makes, but suddenly Steve Blackman shows up and he's gotta go. Remember when I said that there wasn't much of Degeneration X left? Well, a match like you're gonna see here is one of the big primary reasons. Road Dog and X Pac are kind of doing their own thing, more or less, as Triple H is involved in the world title picture, and they have a bit of a friendly rivalry over the last several weeks that has turned into anything but. They let each other get stink faced, X Pac inadvertently headbutts Dog through a table, Road Dog lets X Pac get the last ride. Some quick back and forth for the two to start things off here. X Pac going for the Bronco Buster early on, but Dog gets out of the way. Pac with a cool little jump up into a sleeper. He hits the Bronco Buster later on. The crowd doesn't know who to cheer or boo outright here, but Dog is getting more of the cheers for sure. He does the jabs, the dance, the Paul Orndorff shaky knees. The X Factor is blocked. Dog goes for the pump handle slam, but X Pac hits Dick Kick City, and Tim White has to glance away from it, and the X Factor and the win. X Pac on the mic right afterwards saying the better man won, so let's shake on it. Woo! They shake, but Dog hits him with his own low blow and the pump handle. I'm gonna give it two stars out of five. Bit of a strange feud, this one. Like I said, the crowd doesn't really know what to make of this because up until this point, both wrestlers were very much heels, being the kind of uh, running buddies and the goons for Triple H. But as this storyline progresses for the main title picture, you know, Road Dogg and, uh, and X Pac are just like miles away from this scene. They have nothing to do with the whole love triangle storyline that's happening in the main event picture. So they're kind of left with this friendly rivalry thing, which of course is collapsing. And this is pretty much the beginning of the end of DX as we know it from that revival they had uh, in the year 2000. They do a big thank you to Vinny's Steakhouse, which apparently was a favorite location for WWF wrestlers around this time. The owner was a good friend of Vincent Mann, so there's your story. Backstage, Eddie Guerrero chatting with his mamacita, China. He says he'll support China even if she wins the Intercontinental title tonight, but China's saying one of them's getting lucky for sure. Elsewhere, Trish Stratus planting the seeds for China in Playboy. I mean, centerfold material? Who would you, as a man, as a man, who do you want to see in a centerfold? But Val tries to keep things focused by saying tonight's about the championship and Trish better carry her part. On we go to that intergender match for the Intercontinental Championship as Val Venus defending with his partner Trish Stratus against Eddie Guerrero and China. Trish is pivoting from her feud with Lita for the time being at least, and she's kind of gotten into the crosshairs of China as of late as Eddie and Val are fighting for the championship. And so China really wants a piece of Trish after all this. So Commissioner McFoley makes this intergender match for the championship. Should be very interesting. Eddie and Val start things off. Eventually China gets in there lays into Val with a clothesline. Val's just bumping his ass off for his opponents early on here. Trish with the cheap shot though allows Val to take over. China avoids the elbow drop but with the referee distracted hits her trademark low blow. China makes the tag to Eddie and he's very intense until he's dropped into the turnbuckle. A big collision in the ring and we get a double down. Trish makes the tag and goes to cover Eddie who kicks out. China gets tagged in and she gets her shots in on Trish. Eddie's thrown out of the ring. He pulls Val out and China press slams Trish the cover and the win, and by doing so, China has become a two-time Intercontinental Champion. Boy, this is just how these pay-per-views around this time were, you know, these really quick matches, you know, not a whole lot of time to get into a third gear or anything. I am going to give this one two stars out of five. I think that Eddie and Val, you know, carried their end of the bargain pretty well here. Trish, despite being the least experienced out of all of the people involved, I think still kind of carried her end as well. Uh, I, but it, the whole story of this is not very good. People often forget that China's a two-time Intercontinental Champion, or they'll forget where the second reign began, because everyone kind of knows, oh, China beating Jeff Jarrett the previous year, the good housekeeping match, as silly and wild as it was, that was really memorable. And so China getting that, 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 be, that, that part of her arc, I think was really well earned and everything. This one kind of comes to me out of nowhere. If you want China to look good and become a viable intercontinental champion, let her beat Val Venus. It just seems to, strange to me that, you know, you kind of cut Val off at the legs because he's in the middle of this singles push. He had this great match with Rikishi at No Mercy that he barely survived after Rikishi splatted him for the top of the cage, but you have this rain here where he gets out by hook or by crook, and ultimately he's not even beat for it, and it's at the hands of his, you know, partner in Trish, and so I don't think Val looks good here. I don't think China looks like a particularly, you know, conquering hero to beat up the poor defenseless valet who doesn't wrestle uh, to, to earn that second championship. If you didn't have the championship as part of this matchup and you just had a straight-up intergender match and everything else about it was the same, I don't think I would have that feeling about this one because, hey, China got her 
her shit in against Trish and she got her revenge uh, and that would have been that and Val would have stayed the Intercontinental Champion and it would have been fine. Now you could say that because China wins here it does set up what the eventual breakup angle between her and Eddie Guerrero because that starts over the IC Championship but you know I guess you could say the ends justify the means but as far as Val Venus's reign as Intercontinental Champion goes this was not a great way to end it. We get a recap of the radio WWF event from WWF New York in Times Square. Then backstage we see Janet, the hair and makeup lady, won the hot wrestle goss from Stephanie about Kurt kissing her. Is he a hunk or a hottie? Why not both? Steph emphasizes that he kissed her, not the other way around, but says that Kurt is a good kisser. Ooh. Hey there, JR. Let's talk about this candy jar. You know, this candy jar we've always had here, but I'm now mentioning it for the first time. What a nice candy jar, huh, JR? In our next matchup, Jerry the King Lawler gets up from the announce desk to take on his new rival in Taz. As we saw in the Fully Loaded 2000 review, Taz has come back from injury a changed man. He is going full-blown heel now as opposed to his babyface run that he had when he first debuted earlier in the year. He's got new ring attire, a new change of attitude, and right now he's directing all his anger and vitriol toward good old JR to the point where Jerry Lawler finally stands up for his friend and his broadcast colleague, setting things up for this matchup here. And you've seen for weeks Taz getting cheap shots on Lawler, Jerry dumping a whole bunch of boxes like cartoon style onto Taz on the outside. This is a very heated feud. On the go-home Smackdown, there's actually a moment where Taz seems to abduct Jim Ross and keep him trapped in Jerry Lawler's rental car. He spray paints all over it. He smashes the window. And in doing so, some of the glass actually gets in JR's eye and causes some profuse bleeding. You can see the damage still on JR's face as this show happens. Well, hey folks, did you like the badass stoic, power-walking, mean, mug-looking Taz in the old days of ECW and to a lesser extent how he debuted here in the company? Well, wait till you see his new super heel look. He comes out with a black cowboy hat, sunglasses, and a walking stick trying to find his way around. The cowboy hat has a 13 logo on it. I gotta admit, this is actually pretty amazing. Lawler gets up though and jumps him. Lawler with the punches goes for a big fist drop, but Taz dodges it. Taz goes for a top rope senton, which of course he was always so well known for and he misses. Lawler comes back and hits his pile driver, but Taz just no sells it. Taz is right on up. Referee Teddy Long laid out, Taz making menacing threats toward JR. He puts Lawler in the Katahajime when JR's finally had enough and gets up, blasts Taz with his trusty and ever present candy jar. Lawler covers and wins. Funny that Taz no sold a pile driver, but is debilitated by sugar glass. I give it one star out of five. You know what? They really wanted Taz to become more of a WWF style heel, by which I mean loudmouthed and ignorant, because that's what they accomplished here in this matchup with Taz. Gone are the days, the human suplex machine Taz right around here, and uh, it's sad to see. It's sad to see done this way, and I feel they really did Taz dirty in this Jerry Lawler feud. The fact that he got outsmarted by JR and King, because they say after the match, we had a plan all along and it worked. I was going to hit him with this glass jar and everything. Aren't I noble? It just seems like they didn't want Taz with two Z's to work like Taz with one Z. And you've got a brief glimpse of it in this thing because they make him this loudmouth goofy heel at the beginning and then he takes the power driver, he tazzes up so you get a brief sliver of that old ECW fire in him and then it's just quickly extinguished. Yeah, and so I think it ultimately did not look well for Taz. These guys would have a rematch the following month in Unforgiven, which saw the debut of Raven helping Taz out to eventually beat Lawler. Backstage, Lillian Garcia wants to chat with Shane McMahon, who has escaped Steve Blackman long enough to get dressed. What do you think about Kurt kissing Steph? Boom! Blackman comes in again and the chase is on. That matchup is next for the Hardcore Championship as Shane McMahon defends against the lethal weapon, Steve Blackman. Um, why? That's my biggest question going into this matchup. Why does it exist? Like we know in hindsight what's going to happen and the big iconic moment we're going to see in the finish of this thing. And that's great, but the build, if you want to call it that for this matchup, really had me scratching my head. Because if you're watching Raw week to week, right, Shane McMahon is hanging out with Kurt Angle. He's hanging out with Chris Benoit. He was hanging out with the big show until he was sent to OVW. More on that in a bit. But Shane's there. He's got his fingers in a 
lot of different pots right now, including the main event scene as he's supposed to be working with Kurt Angle and everything. So out of nowhere on the go home Raw, they announced Shayna's challenged Blackman for the Hardcore Championship. And Blackman, by the way, is just doing his own thing in the mid card, not even near this main event stuff that Shane would feasibly be involved in. So Shane hires every other heel on the roster to beat down Blackman until Shane hits the kill hit with the kendo stick to the back of the head. He wins the Hardcore title, but Mick Foley makes a rematch for SummerSlam, suspends the 24-7 rule for the time being so Shane can't conveniently lose it to somebody else. And there we go. But like, there's no reason. I mean, I think there is a reason and I'll explain in a little bit. But from a storyline perspective, the fact this match is happening at all makes no sense because all Shane could have done was stay in his lane. Blackman starts off by giving Shane a free shot with the kendo stick, but it's a trap. Shane flees, but Blackman cuts him off at the other end. Blackman with a big thrust kick off the top of the barricade onto Shane. Blackman puts a trash can on Shane, just beats the hell out of it with those beaten sticks. I know they're called escrima sticks. I've had a lot of people in the comments section tell me that over the years, but still, I call them beaten sticks. Blackman chokes out Shane with a big leather strap until Test and Albert, TNA, show up and jump him. Big Shane's a pussy chant as TNA have Blackman held up for Shane to get a shot in, but Blackman karate's his way out of it. I do love that little leaping dink Shane did around this time. They drag him to the set and Jerry Lawler just goes, Blackman has no friends. Blackman fights Backman. I just made that up. Shane knows the best way to escape someone is to climb up the set as far away as possible. Blackman chases Shane up with a kendo stick. He hits him a couple of times. Shane plummets many, many, many feet down to the pad below. Blackman's not nearly as dumb. He climbs about halfway down. Then he leaves leaps onto Shane below. We get a three count and Blackman wins to regain the Hardcore Championship. This one gets four stars out of five for me just because of how insane that ending is. You know, Shane McMahon is a crazy son of a gun and you could see it during this time. He's taken all these big falls and whatnot. This one is just one of the many for him to take that just kind of blind fall back bump uh, all that whole height, way higher than anything you saw from Mick Foley in either of those Hell in a Cell matches, is just insane. And yes, he had a big crash pad that he did a really good job covering up, but it's still a heinous looking bump and like not one that many people would be willing to take. And so for Shane to do that, I think is incredibly bold of him. Also for Blackman for doing his own leap, even though it wasn't nearly as tall, still a very impressive one. But yeah, it was just, I think that story, even though it was so abruptly formulated, I think that what they did in the match itself was pretty entertaining. And now that I realize, oh man, like having all the, the ramifications of this matchup on the show, it's like, man, they really had to come up with an extreme way to write Shane McMahon out of being involved in the main event. Backstage, Stephanie is very worried at what she sees with Shane. Kurt Angle comes in and is totally oblivious. Oh, I think he just had the wind knocked out of him. Oh my God, that was an incredible line. I love that. So Kurt gives her a supportive hug, but then Commissioner Mick Foley walks in on them and razzes them for a little bit. On we go now to a two out of three falls match as Chris Jericho takes on Chris Benoit. Um, graphic out of date much? This bitter and physical rivalry has been escalating week after week, month after month, to the point where things get really serious and people start rhyming. I will fight Chris Benoit on a boat. Chris Benoit with a goat. The match starts out with fists flying. On the outside, Benoit throwing Jericho head first into the post. A tombstone position countered into a shoulder breaker. JR bringing up the last two out of three falls match on pay-per-view was Triple H and The Rock. We get the cross face and Jericho taps pretty quickly so Benoit has the first pin. Music plays for a few seconds and stops. Benoit putting the cross face back on. Jericho fights and fights for the ropes though. Benoit just keeps attacking the neck and shoulder area of Jericho. Jericho with some brilliant last second counters into the walls. Benoit cannot get to the ropes and he taps. Jericho's music plays for a few seconds as well to keep things fair. Benoit fights back. We get a full Nelson suplex into a bridge and a pin to kick out. Jericho with the top rope Hurricane Rana. A quick roll up by Jericho is countered. Benoit grabbing the ropes out of the referee's view and he wins the match. I'm going to give it four and a half stars out of five. I love this 
match. I love the physicality. I love the technical aspect of it all. Uh, were it not for the very next match on this show, I think I would have given this match of the night honors because of how good it was. I loved this storyline and this feud back in the day. I think Jericho and Benoit do have amazing chemistry during this time, and it's reflected not just here, but also all the other matches they had before and after this, and even the brief window of time where they were tag team partners the following year. Uh, this is just another chapter in this really strong feud between the two of them, and like I said, this is one of the better matches of the night by far. Let's replay the backstage segment we just saw with Stephanie and Kurt before this matchup, and then it's time for tables, ladders, and chairs. Oh my! Tables, ladders, and chairs. Oh my! You know, it's a shame that they never carried that chant on as a classic, eternal WWE staple when it comes to this matchup. It's the first TLC match as Edge and Christian defend the Tag Team Championships against the Dudley Boys and the Hardy Boys. Jesus, those belts look high up. It is chaos from the get-go. These guys working primarily with the chairs and ladders as the fans chant for tables. Big double Russian leg sweep off the two ladders. We get a bubba bomb off a ladder at one point. Matt takes a fall off of one ladder. He lands on another and it seesaws right into Jeff's face. Holy shit. All I can think of when I see that spot is just goes immediately goes to what happens several years later with Joey Mercury at that pay-per-view where his face is just exploded from the ladder. The Dudleys with the super was up. Moments later, a big 3D to Christian through a table. Diva! Kill them! Gives Christian the rocket launcher onto the edge ladder sandwich. My god. Matt and Devon are climbing up, and Devon, famously a man who is afraid of heights, they are grabbing onto the cables, suddenly hanging all the way up in the air when the ladder's gone. Devon plummets, Matt is hit with a ladder and goes down. Edge and Christian climb the ladder and grab the belts to retain. Four and a half stars out of five on this one. This is just an insane matchup. What they did at WrestleMania earlier this year with the Triangle Tables match, they elevated it and just took it to a whole new ridiculous level with this first TLC match. You know, it's a cliche, but these guys absolutely broke the mold of what a match of this kind is supposed to be, for better or for worse, because some people may not like the fact that you know, ladder matches have evolved into such a state that they are now, but it's these six individuals that really just kind of set that standard. It's so funny because people will say, oh my gosh, these kinds of matches are going to shorten your careers. Like, all but a couple of the people who are in this match are like still wrestling today or just only recently stopped. So I don't think it's that detrimental, clearly, if they're able to keep going with it. But yeah, this match is just an all-timer. It's, uh, it's a very brisk, like, 15 minute matchup. It gets to buy relatively quickly with all the stuff they do and it's just so chaotic and fun to watch. May not be fun to experience if you're one of those wrestlers, but do check this one out. It is historic. It is worth the hype. And of course, Edge and Christian totally reek of awesomeness. Backstage, Triple H is all like, what were you thinking kissing Kurt on Thursday? Uh, by the way, how have Triple H and Stephanie not communicated to each other at all since Thursday? They're a married couple. So you know how around the beginning of the video I was talking about how WWF was trying to tone their stuff down, you know, they got rid of the Godfather character, they changed Val Venus's shtick, DX isn't as vulgar anymore. Well, like I said, baby steps, because there was still some sleaze to be had with the thong stink face match as the cat takes on Terry Runnels. Cat is accompanied by Al Snow, Terry by Perry Saturn, who insists on covering her with a towel. What a heel. Big body slam by Cat. What a shock to start this match off here. Saturn tries taking Terry away from all this madness, but Snow cuts them off, pushing Terry back in. Cat spanks Terry, gives her the Bronco Buster. She goes to back it up, but Saturn with the shove when the referee doesn't see it. Cat is surprised Surprisingly, the workhorse of this matchup. Terry goes for the stink face, but she is shoved head first in the referee's crotch. Cat hits her with head, gives her that big old stink face to win. Al celebrates with Cat and puts her crotch in his face for a bit. This one gets a half star out of five for me. You know what? That half star goes solely to the cat and her just incredible level of worksmanship. You know, that totally blew me away and defied all my expectations. But one question was really swirling in my head throughout this whole matchup. Where the hell was right to censor? Like, my God, their whole thing is about this war against, you know, things that are immoral, war against scantily clad women. Cat and Terry were dressed less conservatively than Victoria and the other hoe in the opener. Send a copy of your cable or satellite bill to get a pair of rock sunglasses. Wow. Then it's time for the reigniting of one of those classic WWF rivalries, albeit in a completely slapdash, illogical, and hilarious manner as Kane takes on The Undertaker. 
Undertaker. This was not the original plan for this matchup at SummerSlam. What happened was the day after Foley loaded, the Big Show came back from injury. He turned heel that night, joining up with Shane McMahon, and the whole plan was he was going to feud with The Undertaker. It was The Big Show, it was Kurt Angle, it was Chris Benoit, and it was Shane McMahon leading the whole group, and they were just kind of doing Shane's bidding and picking apart the bones of all these different people. It was like Benoit going after Jericho, Triple H going after The Rock, or Kurt Angle, I should say, going after The Rock, and then you had The Big Show going after Taker and Kane because there was an episode of SmackDown where they made a big hole in the stage, and The Big Show chokeslammed Kane through it and onto the floor, but then it turns out WWF just couldn't wait a moment longer to take The Big Show off the road, off of TV, and send him down to OVW for more conditioning and just to get his mind right for the business. They didn't like his attitude, basically, and they didn't like his physique and the fact that he was getting blown up so quickly. So they were in the middle of the storyline, and they had to change everything on a dime because The Big Show was being taken off of programming. So how do we rectify this? Well, a couple weeks after Kane was choked into the floor, you've got him coming back here, a seemingly to save Taker, but then he just randomly turns on him. He choke slams him and makes a hole in the ring. And then on that SmackDown, he goes, why did I choke slam my brother? I am a monster! Which, oh my God, that is so lame and so cheesy. And that's the only explanation he ever gave was, I'm a monster. That is why I beat up my brother. You couldn't even like half-ass an excuse saying, I got beat up by the big show and the rest of his guys. And like, you didn't help me. So I'm going to take it out on you. That would have been 10 times times better than what they just kind of resigned themselves to here and saying, I'm a monster. And so he's this big heel now, but he still does this whole cowardly like, whoa, whoa, begging off Taker when he shows up to confront him right after that. And even Michael Cole's like, why is Kane turning on his own flesh and blood? Like, do we all have selective memory from what happened like a year or two before this? Like Taker admitted he started the fire that killed their parents. Like no shit he turned on him. Needless to say, there is a whole lot of lore we're just choosing to omit because Taker is a biker now. That makes this suffer, in my opinion. The brawl begins in the aisle, makes its way to the ring. Taker going for the mask right away. The brawl continues. Kane is dinked. Taker rips the mask some more. I gotta admit, the angle is dumb, but that is a badass look for Kane there. Taker just hucks the steps into Kane's face. My god. Kane now bleeding. We finally get a good shot of it. Kane fires up, but Taker fights back. He goes for the mask one more time, and it stays on. Kane with the goozle. Taker with Dick Kick City. He finally rips the mask off in time. Entirely, Kane now powders and flees. He obscures his face with his hair. Taker's music plays. The official result is a no contest. Jim Ross keeps saying there was not an opening bell in this matchup, but there was. They've had a chance to edit it out, but they haven't. The Undertaker after Kane to meet his brother. I give it a star and a half. This match was a lot more one-sided than I remember it being. And to top it all off, the finish kind of sucked. Like the whole scrambling to say, oh, it was a no contest. The match never got started, but you know, they had the bell. So technically Taker wins by count out. I think that the entirely wrong way to end this because I liked the fact of Taker like ripping the mask and everything and tearing it. You see that exposed part of his face for the first time. He's bleeding. That would have been the ideal moment for Kane to just like snap because he sees his blood and he just becomes this big monster. He says he is and just beats the bejesus out of Taker and gets that big win. And then you can kind of continue on down the road with more matches between them. But no, you've just totally like you've exposed him now and then Taker makes him look like a total chump after Kane chokes him through the damn ring. And to me, that was one of the biggest uh, bad spots on this whole show. Like, you could have had that whole segment, and I think it would have been fine if the ending was just the opposite of what it was. Backstage, Kurt Angle's looking to call somebody. It was Stephanie. She answers the phone, but suddenly pretends it's her mom on the other line. Triple H wants to say hi to her. Yeah, remember when I threatened to have sex with her last year? Great times. Let's reminisce. Oh gosh, she hung up. Weird. In a triple threat match for the WWF Championship with no countouts and no disqualifications, the People's Champion, The Rock, defends against Kurt Angle and Triple H. Kurt Angle has been encroaching on the personal space of his good friend, Stephanie McMahon Helmsley. It began as a business relationship when Stephanie was accompanying Kurt to the ring for a while. Eventually, he and Triple H both become number one contenders after they pinned Chris Jericho at the same time in a match on Raw. And for the next several weeks, they are on again, off again allies in their fight 
against The Rock as Stephanie is caught between these two big brutes. This is a really well done storyline during this time. I think it's one of the top angles of the year in the WWF. I would argue I think they had maybe one week too many of building this thing because after a while it got kind of redundant uh, before SummerSlam, but I think there was a lot of good here. I mean, the moment of Triple H trying to teach Trish Stratus some wrestling moves. He's caught with her. He bent over. He's like, no, it's not what you think. Uh. And then like on the go home uh, Smackdown before SummerSlam, Kurt is tending to this near unconscious Stephanie and like plants a kiss on her. Like, oh my God, what a sleaze bag. Uh, meanwhile, there's The Rock. He's the champion in all this, but he is such a third wheel in the storyline. But I don't think it really takes away from it because The Rock is still presented really strong and he's still able to outsmart Kurt and Triple H at times. Uh, but yeah, the story the story is really on, on Triple H and Kurt here, and I think it's being done really well. Kurt comes out first and on the live mic says that he apologizes for not kissing Stephanie sooner because he's a go-getter. He's a gold medalist with no second thoughts. He says he gave Stephanie some gold medal winning passion, baby. Triple H shows up and the two fight for a couple of minutes. They fight on the Spanish announce table. Trips goes for a pedigree, but the table gives early and Kurt face plants and suffers a big old concussion. Finally, The Rock shows up and the mash can get underway. Trips and The Rock work each other while Kurt is still being checked on by the doctors and is eventually carted off. Triple H using the force to lift Rocky onto the top rope. Trips grabs Kurt on the gurney and does some more damage until The Rock intervenes. Stephanie shows up and checks on Kurt as he's finally wheeled to the back. She comes back to ringside despite Triple H's protests. Stephanie just slaps Mark Yeaton in the face and steals the title belt, goes to hit Rocky but hits her husband instead. After Stephanie is escorted away, Trips grabs Sledgy, hits Rock in the tum tum with it. Someone get rid of the damn hammer is a phrase you'll hear JR say a lot tonight. Triple H works The Rock's core for several minutes. Rock hits a superplex and both men are down. We cut to the back. Stephanie convinces a half-conscious and fully concussed Kurt to go back out there and help Trips for her. I'll... I'll do it for you, Steph. Steph now dragging a wobble-legged Kurt to ringside. Take this man to a local medical facility for fuck's sake. Triple H hits the pedigree, still yoinked out by Kurt. Angle goes for a cover. There's a kick out. Somehow this man is still able to continue working a match. He hits suplexes on the rock, takes bumps, just absolutely insane behavior. There's a rock bottom and Triple H yoinks him out. Stephanie throws in the damn hammer, which someone should get rid of. Kurt intercepts it. Stephanie's in the ring. Trips hits her on accident. Kurt dinks H with the sledgy. Rock throws out Kurt. Rock hits the people's elbow on Triple H to win and retain the title. Great call here from JR where he says, through hell, high water, sledgehammers, and wives, The Rock retains the championship. Triple H is still laid out as Kurt pulls Stephanie out of the ring and carries her off and gives him a mean little look. Ooh, he knows what he's doing even though he's not all there. I give the match four stars out of five. Now, we can all say with the power of hindsight that Kurt Angle had no business going back out there to do anything in that matchup. And when you hear Kurt Angle talk about the matchup, he has no memory of what happens here after he gets the concussion. He has said that he only comes to like two hours after the show is over. So he's on autopilot the entire time. Like he says in, in, in his book and he says in interviews that like Stephanie and Triple H and The Rock had to like talk him through everything. Okay, you gotta do this now. You gotta pull him here. You gotta do this thing. Like they're calling the match for him. They're calling spots. Like in today's world, they never let that happened. He would have got concussed or whatever, and they would have kept him back there. They would have kept it to be a one-on-one -on -one match, and I think we all could have given them some slack for it. But, you know, I'm not going to like get too mad about it because this is the knowledge of the time. People didn't know what concussions were like back then or how serious it could be to keep working through them. So Kurt should count himself very lucky that he didn't get worse uh, him working through it. It does, I guess in that way, make the match more exciting. The fact that he was able to do that, I guess. Triple H and Rock clearly you know, they made it seamless, you know, even though Kurt was supposed to be laid out for part of it, like that was the whole point of the pedigree on the table, it was still, they had to just like work through it and, you know, figure out things on the fly, which I think is incredibly impressive that they were able to do that and really not miss a beat. I think that was really the mark of how Rock and Triple H carry this whole thing. And so that's why I rate the match as highly as I do. But yeah, it's just, it's crazy to think about that. Just that like Kurt Angle, like this is like, again, within his first year in the company, he does this and it's all part of like 
the bumps and bruises he went through on his way to becoming like one of the greatest of all time. My grade for SummerSlam 2000 is a B plus. You know, there are a lot of matches on this show, 10 in all. Some of them are pretty forgettable and a lot of them are very short. But what I like about this show is that almost every match has a really great story running through it. And like a lot of the finishes have you like yearning to see what's gonna happen, you know, next week, what's gonna happen tomorrow night on Raw and all these things. And I think it was just, this is, you know, they call this the kind of the peak of the attitude era for a, a, for a good reason because the storytelling is there, the characters are there, even though there's no Steve Austin. I think the company is still just chugging along so well, and it really boils down to you know, you could have the best technical wrestlers, the best workers uh, alive, you know, working your shows, but if the stories aren't there, then people aren't gonna care, and like me, they're not gonna remember. It is a very strong show during a very strong year. I had my druthers about this thing because I remember how bad Taker and Kane was and I remember the thong stink face match and everything but you know you remember there are a lot of really good matches still in this thing uh, some of which they actually give decent time to and so I think it's definitely a show worth checking out. But what did you think of SummerSlam 2000, folks? Let me know in the comment section below. Be sure to give the video a thumbs up if you like it. Subscribe to Wrestling With Regret. Hit that bell icon to get all the notifications. Next time on the Classic Review, we are diverting a little bit from our SummerSlam content to focus on things on the WCW side of things. That's Clash of the Champions 24. If you recall the chaos that happened at Beach Blast 93, this is the follow-up event that shows Davey Boy Smith vying for that WCW champion against Big Van Vader. But until then, folks, I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.